Hi everybody, welcome along to the uh, event this afternoon. My name's Matt Setcher, I'm the IT Services Lead for uh, Lords IT. It's really great to have you all along here, see such a good turnout of everybody. Um, so thank you for taking the time. Just so that everybody understands that this meeting is being recorded and will be shared and uploaded to YouTube uh, later on for others to follow. Um, and obviously other people in the meeting can see who's joined it and your details um, from that way. Um, I'd like to welcome our uh, speakers and our guests from Bromcom and from Arbor and I'll introduce you to them uh, in just a sec. But yeah, just a, a couple of uh, housekeeping. Um, the, there is a Q&A at the end. Um, so if you want to ask a question, take a note of it, ask us at the end just so we can keep things moving. Um, and it's great to see so many faces as well as we're presenting. It's always great to present to people rather than to blank screen. So uh, it's great to see you all. So uh, a little bit about today um, and what we're going to be talking about. So this uh, event was something that I thought would be useful to schools, um, in particular following recent announcements from some uh, companies about uh, long term signups to non cloud based solutions and also following general conversations with schools um, that we support and that I, that I work with and advise about just wanting some awareness about cloud generally without the technical jargon to go with it. So hopefully this event will break down some of that technical jargon for you um, and set everybody off on a good starting place on what is cloud, what are the benefits for, um, of it and uh, how they can make those first steps within their schools. And if they're already doing things, are they doing uh, things the same as other people and do they have any questions as well? So there's about, I think there was about 70 uh, sign up. So obviously we expect a few less than that, but I can see there's a good number of people on the call, which was great. The more the merrier. So it'll be great to hear some of your experiences at the end. Um, to introduce uh, a few people that we've got here, um, uh, we'll start with uh, the person. This is me at the top here, um, the, the best looking one of the lot, obviously. And then underneath here, you've got Jez, although Jez isn't probably looking that helpful at the moment because unfortunately he's off work today, not feeling very well. So we've got his colleague uh, here, Martin um, from uh, Bromcom, uh, who will be uh, taking over and delivering his session. So hi to Martin. Um, and then we've got Beth at the top here. Um, and she's on the chat as well. And then we've got Rebecca down the down the bottom. Um, is that right, Beth? Is it Rebecca? Yep. Just double checking. I'm getting people's names right, um, and uh, that you're here. And they're both from Arbor. Uh, so uh, the sessions will go for a bit from me, a bit talking through um, an introduction for, for education for cloud. Half an hour for Arbor overview, view, half an hour for Bromcom uh, overview, and then 15 minutes or however long we need afterwards for a bit of Q&A. And the uh, Bromcom and Arbor representatives will stay around and be available to ask any questions. And you can always go into a break off room if, if that's that's easier, depending on what questions that you've got at the end to do it. So that's today's agenda. So we're going to dive straight on in to talking a little bit of an introduction um, for cloud uh, for schools. Um, and this is an area that I've been working on across many schools now for the last three or four years really. If you'd asked me three years ago, would we be in the position we are now? I would have said you're crazy, go away. Um, but certainly the pandemic has brought across a huge adoption of cloud for schools and education, but also the advancements of multi academies and the growth of these multi academies um, in the uh, education sector. Lots of schools are looking at that at cloud of being the way to bring together networks, make them easier to manage, make them uh, cost savings across multiple schools and sharing some really good uh, programs and, and uh, um, solutions across multiple schools. So. What is cloud? Starting really at the basics here. Um, and uh, the, the basis, basic definition of it is about understanding that it's hosting either services or managing solutions outside of your school um, on somebody else's server elsewhere. And it, usually these are server farms um, that are run by big organizations. So Amazon do a lot, Microsoft do a lot for their Azure platform. And there are lots and lots of uh, different providers that do them and they have these systems uh, running um, and you will never see one of their servers unless you go on a tour or something. You'll never see one of their servers or something that they're running. 
and uh, rather than being on traditional servers in school, um, then they're, they're managed out where, outside. So what is the benefit of these of having some of these cloud systems? Well, we'll dive into it more in a, in a minute, but you know, one of the obvious things is the ability to save money on managing uh, your systems and having to update them all yourselves when they're obviously in the cloud. That's taken care of for you. But that's not to say there aren't risks and we'll walk, talk through some of those as well. Um, but yeah, some of the really good benefits of it is um, this access systems on any device, anywhere, anytime. Um, and that's something that um, the education sector has wanted for a long time and plugged gaps with laptops being brought into school and syncing or remote desktop solutions. Um, and their, their way of accessing data um, into a central location, but they're not the same as having something that's cloud managed. So uh, I was talking about, you know, where schools are and, and what the next steps are, and this is all my view on it. Um, and basically, uh, currently we have schools um, are still running a majority of systems on local servers in each school. Um, and as school groups in Trust and Maths expand, um, then obviously that means it's harder to transfer information between schools, between networks and even single schools. Uh, it's often harder for them to make that information accessible externally, at least in a safe and secure way. Um, and with the growth in uh, people working from home, then obviously that, that's a need that schools have. So we're still very much, I think, with the majority of schools uh, having most of their systems or at least a large proportion of their important systems based on local uh, local servers. Sometimes though, we are seeing uh, more and more uptake of a hybrid solution where some of the key services are put into the cloud and MIS systems such as Arbor and Bromcom and competitors are a key example of this. Those, those systems that are critical are placed into the cloud, but the local servers still handle perhaps data, logons, local or legacy software that they've used as well. We're seeing quite a few of that popping up and around um, and it's a journey for the schools to go through to being fully cloud. We, uh, Laws IT, myself and the team, we've migrated probably about 20 or 30 schools to the cloud um, in the uh, uh, in the last couple of years, um, but only probably about 10 of those are fully cloud. That means all the devices, all the settings, all the um, services are delivered from a cloud platform um, and there are no local servers on site anymore. Um, that is where it's heading and that is where education will end up um, in the future with all these systems in the cloud and no local infrastructure. And that's quite exciting really because that allows money that's previously been tied up in infrastructure and servers to um, be freed up for devices and making sure that connectivity is the top of the importance pile. So that could be faster, more reliable broadband with backup lines. It could be um, ensuring that you've got the fastest infrastructure, whether that's wired or wireless around and enhancing how many devices are out there in the hands of students and teachers. And of course, the best way for adoption to grow is uh, for more and more people to be using it and have an access to it wherever they need it. So it's a really exciting time and a real pivoting moment for education and IT. So as I've already talked about, some of the uh, elements that we really need to focus on for schools when we're looking at uh, adoption of cloud um, isn't just what, what platform am I going to, um, you know, it's about looking at the the core risks, I guess, and uh, and elements that you might not have placed as much importance on before. And one of those is the connectivity. So you'll probably need uh, faster broadband with more bandwidth than you've ever had before. You may well need backup options, certainly from secondary secondary schools, but even primary schools need backup plans. Um, and Obviously, they can be as simple as we'll walk down the road to somebody who's got the internet or we'll turn on 4G on our mobile or we'll have a dongle, but you know, how can you get access into the systems if your connectivity is down? Um, there's a big, uh, it's obviously been a big um, lot of media attention and, and regulation attention on GDPR and uh, data security as well. Um, GDPR uh, doing that backwards into systems that have been established for so long, it is really difficult to manage. 
Um, you can put policies and, and stuff in place all you like, but it's not going to save Dorothy or Barry um, saving their whole life and all their communication on their uh, user area. So, um, you know, using systems in the cloud can make uh, that a lot easier to manage as well. Um, also allows you to have a lot more of an auditable trail for data security, much more protection, which we'll come on to in a bit as well. There's obviously huge risks as well around cybersecurity. Not a day goes by now, really, where you don't hear of risks from cybersecurity. Um, I know over the summer there was one that a lot of IT people shuddered about, which is over in the Isle of Wight, where many schools were left with nothing after some of their devices were, uh, their networks that were all managed by one provider were wiped and uh, encrypted, and the uh, schools didn't have access to any backups. Um, so it's really important that that's the top of the agenda as well. Well, especially as we're saying, you know, any device anywhere, anytime, that's a whole new challenge for protecting. And then also around backing up data in the cloud, because you still got a responsibility to make sure that that data is backed up. You still got a responsibility to understand your retention periods. You still got um, your disaster recovery plan still have to be in place, albeit on a different system. And a lot of people assume because data is in the cloud, whether that be in Office 365 or whether that be in Google, that that data is backed up. Um, and that's not the case. They don't back up. What they do is they guarantee um, access to a point, um, but they don't guarantee backups. And obviously there's multiple times when you might need a backup, not least because uh, a teacher or somebody has accidentally overwritten a document or something similar. So there's lots of reasons for having backups, of course, and you've got to make sure that you meet those needs in the cloud as well. So there's some key factors there in cloud adoption, which might slow it down, might accelerate it. It can work either way, but there's certainly questions that schools should be aware of and shouldn't just take their data and dump it in a cloud platform. Form. It's very important that they understand how that um, uh, location is managing their data, the security aspect, aspect of it, where the data is stored. You know, are there, have you done a DPIA, data protection, protection impact assessment on it? All these different elements that you need to check to make sure that you're following the law, following the rules, um, but also ultimately that your data and your young people and your teachers' data is safe and secure as well. So I'm going to break down now uh, into two key sections. So the use of the cloud systems and then how you can uh, manage data, devices and data from the cloud as well. So traditionally at the moment you will have a, um, a uh, local network which will manage your data and will manage your user access and all sorts. And when you move to cloud that changes um, uh, in terms of how you implement it and how you manage it and we'll talk a bit about the the key changes out in a little in a little bit but it's also um, about understanding that uh, you don't have to keep a hybrid and I tweeted recently just a question like I randomly do sometimes is uh, lots of schools are looking for a hybrid solution to help them move into cloud and I, I pondered whether actually that's slowing down adoption of cloud services by having the hybrid set up and whether actually in some cases moving from locally managed network to a fully cloud managed network um, is the best way to do it without that that mid-step of a hybrid because all that that hybrid is doing is enabling probably some uh, older software or um, some ancient way of doing things and actually uh, moving fully to the cloud and embracing the cloud way of working and, and managing devices and managing data fully might be the better way to go but it, it it was it was me pondering rather than having an answer on that one I think um, as well so um, let's just talk about uh, those cloud systems first and then we'll come on as I say to the devices and data in a little bit so in examples of cloud systems, well, there's lots. Pretty much everything that you go out to buy these days, if it's any worth its weight, it's going to be cloud-based in some way and for um, some uh, system. It's important that we understand what cloud-based is, though, compared to those that just can be accessed anywhere. Uh, for example, in a tender for a cloud-based finance system recently, two out of three were said they were cloud-based and they weren't. You could use remote desktop to access them from anywhere but the systems were hosted on the server and I ended up buying two servers for a cloud-based um, system. If you are going for a cloud-based system, you don't need servers of your own. Um, that's that's the whole point of what you're buying and, and buying into. So it's about making sure that the systems are definitely in cloud, but there's finance systems. Some of those are built into um, 
other systems such as MIS systems or HR platforms. Um, so some of both of those elements are based in MIS systems, so that's your management information systems. And that's your equivalent to SIMS if you've currently got that locally. SIMS isn't currently in the cloud. Um, they are talking about the fact that it can be uh, accessed via the cloud, um, but it's not a, not a cloud based system. Um, visitor management, um, which is you know important if you've got multiple sites. Safeguarding systems, you've got your My Concern, you've got your, um, oh, I've forgotten the other one uh, off the top of my head, but there's lots of, of the uh, safeguarding systems that are out there, Senso um, and other, other systems there which allowed you to log safeguarding um, systems. Your VoIP telephone systems are often cloud based these days and of course your communication platforms whether they're built into your MIS or other platforms or cloud based as well. And actually um, in terms of the teach and learning side, this is very much operational here, uh, lots of systems on the teach and learning side have been cloud based for ages. So systems that are based on the web such as MyMaths, uh, accelerated um, reading and, and, and other platforms of, of that kind of ilk have been based in the cloud for ages when you access a website to get to them. Um, it's only now that some of these more complicated systems and these systems that integrate with each other quite a lot are becoming feature uh, ready um, for mass adoption. I think there's been a lot of early adopters and it's gone well and we can all see the benefits of them, but um, it's only recently in the last couple of years that we've seen a full on uh, take up of the uh, the cloud software. And I think um, what are the benefits for cloud systems? Well, they get updated without you having to do anything. Well, that's one of the favorites for IT for IT technicians, but also for the staff using them. You know, the updates are rolled out overnight or, you know, it's without you even knowing and those new features are in place. So if you think when we're talking about MISs in particular, that's no more, um, you know, termly updates, they're done automatically for you. If there's a new DFE update or some data that, you know, they, they need to collect, that's rolled out automatically. Finance systems with new codes or new uh, uh, fixes, bug fixes for anything like that are all rolled out automatically as well well and in terms of the ability to access them they spend a lot more money than what you can as an individual school in making sure that the systems are highly redundant so that means that you can get on even if there is a failure somewhere in that platform you know they, they have um, systems in place to mitigate those risks and mitigate um, any access problems that they have also one of the the great things about them is uh, their interconnectivity so even just looking at this list here all of these can be interconnected in some way across whether that's through a platform such as Google Workspace or Office 365 or um, and I'll give an example on that and you can have uh, your MIS system can be Arbor or Bromcom which integrates with Office 365 or Google um, and that can uh, also talk with your safeguarding systems such as my concern, Senso can link in with all your groups, your VoIP telephony can be through uh, Teams and your communication platform can obviously be Teams or, or Google Workspace space or similar they all interconnect with each other which makes management a lot easier and it makes use and adoption a lot easier and that is one of the bigger um, things that we need to get um, make easier for school is that all these different systems uh, might be different systems behind the scene but for the end user they're dead easy to pick up and the data that they need and the access that they need is in each one so if they're looking for a kid to send a message to they're there. If they're looking to look up the data in an MIS for a child, they're there. If they want to find out how much money that kid spent on sausages all week in on, in the tuck trolley, that information is there as well. Um, want to find out when mum and dad signed in, that's there as well. So it's very important when you're looking at cloud adoption for schools that you look at the whole picture and you don't just look at one element in isolation. You might phase the adoption of different elements of it, but lots of schools say, oh, we'll do this bit first and then we'll move on to the next bit. And actually what you're doing is watering down the um, benefits of moving to cloud and moving to these different systems because it is that complete package of them linking together, which is really exciting and possible for everybody to use. One of the things that I'm working on at the moment is integrating Salamander across all of our sites to create users. So as soon as a, a, a a kid or an adult is registered in our MIS. They're created in our um, Office 365, which then um, puts all their groups and their timetables and all their email in all their Outlook calendars and all sorts and works across the lot and helps link everything up. Now, it costs two thousand pounds, but 
never have to create a user again, never have to work, worry about a user leaving and their account not being deactivated, don't have to worry about a kid moving from set one to set two because it's all automated using data that's already there. So the time that that saves in different people like their math teacher going to admin and saying, oh, Bobby's moved down a set and all this, it's all annihilated because it happens automatically. As soon as that change is made is either in the MIS or elsewhere, it happens fluidly. And that's what we need to make sure is happening for staff and students. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about managing data in the cloud, and this is one which was kind of forced on upon lots of schools during the lockdown, um, you know, putting their information into their OneDrive or their SharePoints for people to access when working from home and doing home learning, or of course Google equivalents. Um, so uh, it's something that a lot of schools have partially adopted rather than fully adopted, and it was one of the things I was um, making management aware of prior to children coming back um, in September was we had the situation where they had they were coming back to an environment where they still had the local drives of data and their cloud drives of data and you've got duplication there and a mess and so you know working really hard to have one place to save things which is accessible everywhere the only solution for that is cloud um, and actually it's pretty easy to do and it makes a huge difference straight away. So many schools already have email in the cloud. Most schools have adopted either Gmail or Office 365 for their email. It's all in the cloud. Very few schools still have local servers on site. And that's, I mean, anybody who's ever managed on site email will tell you that's amazing to not have to manage uh, all that anymore and, and, and do all the exchange updates or similar, um, which were an absolute nightmare. That's all taken care of now. And again, it's one of those things where it's really, you know, Google and Microsoft have much better resources for spam and uh, checking out everything than anybody um, can do on their own. So lots of that e data is already in the cloud and that includes attachments and such like. So actually by moving the data to, uh, to the cloud across everything, it allows you to again take full um, advantage of using cloud. So, for example, you get an email with an attachment, you can share that with others straight away, but in a secure way. And that helps with your, your data and your security because files never leave the platform anymore. They don't get attached to emails, they get shared, which makes granting permissions and sharing that information a lot uh, easier and a lot more secure. There's no chance of them getting you know, uh, interrupted in transit or anything like that. And everything that's put onto these cloud platforms is auditable and searchable. So I had to do a SAR subject access request last week. I did one search on Office 365 for the name and I downloaded everything in an archive and gave it to the person uh, to do. So it's really um, helpful having all that information in one place and not over multiple different platforms and multiple different server locations. It's all in the one system. Um, it's also, you know, a, a staff member logs on from home. They can use the web version, so it doesn't matter what software that they've got. Nobody's left behind, and um, they they obviously get free Office or free Go access to the Google platforms, and they can have access to exactly the same data in schools they do at home. Now, lots of people might have had access to the local documents if it's synced up, but very few had access to staff shares or student shares um, and resources. And actually, a lot of the time, they tried to um, overcome that by putting in. Um, uh, you know, learning environments, online learning environments where they'd update the files and have to do the job twice. So it'd be in the student share and then they'd upload it to any learning platform that they had as well. These days, it's not a worry. They can have it um, put in one place and everybody can have access to it straight away. Um, and uh, you, so you're looking at a lot of work reduction for that. And again, one of the benefits of, of this is the ability to be able to share targeted uh, information. So if you've got it set up right, and I know Bromcom and Arba both do this, um, or programs like Salamander, you can share with a class just by typing in the class name and everybody will get a copy of that document or you know a team will be set up where things can be shared. So again, it all links in um, and the same, you can do exactly the same on Google as well. So um, a couple of points just to think about as well, though, when you're managing data in the cloud is around exam requirements. 
Um, certainly on the secondary level, there are some elements that don't like you use in the internet at all. So if you're going to a fully cloud model, you're going to have to plan around that, but there are absolutely ways around it. Um, and you're going to have to probably update how many devices you've got. If you're looking to put everything on the, the cloud, and certainly all staff, probably all TAs and, and leadership are going to need a device, but also more and more devices out there for students. And again, you know, that ties into everything else, but both Bromcom and Arbor have student uh, logins that they can use to access and see their data. And of course, everything else that they've got as well in terms of other platforms accessing that data. There's no point having it if they can't see it. Um, and again, that's where you can save some money on your existing server infrastructure and invest it into devices as well, whether that's a device scheme or just providing more devices. So we talked about before about the advantages of data in the cloud and just to summarize really it's the availability that is anywhere anytime you can share files and folders across platforms uh, you can collaborate again across devices anywhere anytime so you know you don't need to all be sat in the same room anymore um, you can work together on it for a meeting like this where we're all able to come together um, or just uh, you know working collaboratively on the document in there as well and then when it comes to security you know, massive improvements in terms of uh, you've got the baselines in there from Microsoft and stuff, so you don't have to worry if your technician has set it up right or, you know, applied updates and such like that's all managed for you. And there's a huge um, uh, amount of settings in both Google and Microsoft platforms, which you'd never get locally or never did get locally on those old uh, um, on site platforms. And of course, it's fully auditable and easy for GDPR searches as well, and also for owning your data and knowing where your data is is just focusing on for a moment on the security um, there are obviously increased cybersecurity risks out there if you want to have a look on uh, my youtube there are some sessions i've done specifically on cybersecurity risks and there's also a lot of information on the ncsc website it's national cyber security center specifically for schools and specifically for um, governing bodies specifically uh, for senior leadership teams key questions that you should be asking and what you should be expecting as a response on there. Highly recommend that you do that and there's a video, um, 45 minute video for training um, and I, certainly across our multi academy it was mandatory for all of our staff to watch the video and understand the risks and that's really important when you are adopting cloud-based systems and I'm sure both Arbor and Bromcom will back up on that, you know, security because of the data and the information that you've got on these systems is really, really important. Um, Things like multi-factor authentication, they are very simple to implement, very simple to adopt and have a huge benefit. So that's where you, um, when you log in, you get uh, you have to put in a code from your phone or accept it from your phone or, or get a phone call or something. That kind of protection isn't available really outside the cloud and it's something that we're seeing lots of schools being able to take advantage of. We've also talked about backups before, so you can still back up. Cloud to cloud backups are essential. And I know that we've been reselling um, uh, Barracuda and it costs a pound a month per staff member uh, with unlimited backups of their data, unlimited retention points. It's up to us to set them and it's a penny for the kids. And if you, you know, I know the cost of Veeam and other platforms and are doing on site. If you're paying those costs at the moment, um, you're obviously limited to what you can have. There's bigger risk. Um, as well about having the data on different things. Why would you do it when you can do it cloud to cloud for a pound a person a month? It's, uh, you know, it's really easy to see why that's so um, uh, popular. So uh, I know my time's running out. I'm going over before anybody else is. Um, but uh, just uh, talking a little bit about the main options that you have got there. Actually, I'm not. I've changed the timelines, didn't I? It's got a few more minutes. Um, but go, Google Workspace um, is one of the leaders in education um, uh, platforms. So the, there's this and there's Office 365. Uh, Google have a range of online tools um, that you can access. It integrates. Uh, fully with existing um, Windows systems. You, you just log in using your Google uh, details, do it all through the browser. Um, but you also get to uh, access Chromebooks, which are low cost devices and um, which are web managed and again can be used anywhere, anytime by the end users. Um, Google Workspace, in my experience, is very popular at primary level rather than secondary level um, uh, because um, it's just simple to use, um, no hassle for any of the users and uh, easy to manage for schools that perhaps don't have permanent IT support staff. 
so there's lots of um, options available with it. Um, they've just rebranded. They've got different levels. But if you're looking to break into the cloud, then you can, uh, you know, Google's a good place to start, particularly on a primary level. And if you've got Chromebooks as well. Um, it's important to say that whichever platform you use, you can move between the two very, very easily. Um, so don't think if you choose one and it's not the right one for your your school or your environment that you can't change. And I do know some schools that successfully use both and certainly some trusts that successfully use both and they allow them to choose the right tool for the job. So you can be a Microsoft school, but you can be using Google um, classrooms. Um, that's not a problem at all. If you've got good IT tech, they'll be able to set that up for you. So Office 365, I am a bit more of an Office 365 fanboy. I won't hide that fact from anybody. Um, it's something that I've done some training in and uh, it's certainly all the 50 schools that we support. I think 48 are Office 365 schools. The reason being is that I believe it's a slightly more complete solution, certainly um, for the secondary level. So you can extend what you've currently got and that hybrid it syncs to the cloud you don't have to change a lot to immediately integrate with the cloud um, got applications as well as cloud-based versions so those who are used to using word excel and outlook on the computer can continue to do that without having to use the web-based version and uh, a hidden gem that has only really started to come to fruition in the last couple of years is Intune device management. So Chrome um, Books for Google was is a major reason for their initial success. Affordable devices for schools allowed them to get IT everywhere. It's brilliant. But now we're seeing Microsoft play catch up with a broader range of devices and um, supporting uh, older software and such like because it's based on the Windows platform. And basically you can do exactly the same now for Windows devices that you can with Chromebooks. You can can set them up so out of the box a user just has to turn it on and it will set itself up and they can log in and use everything and it will install all the software all the management over the web and be really nice and easy for people to use and of course if you're looking to be in that hybrid area it will work with existing infrastructure that many schools have got on site as well so it's you know but lots of people say, oh, there's no difference between the two platforms. You have to dig beneath the service surface to find the differences and understand what works best for your schools. Um, they're both really good platforms, so um, very reliable um, and very user friendly with big education communities around them. Google have a, a, a Google um, platform for teachers and Microsoft have the MIE, Microsoft Innovative Educators platform, where you can join together and uh, see how you can actually implement these into the classrooms. Let's just focus on that device management because this is a new area for lots of schools. As I say, those that have adopted Google and Chrome and such like will be used to now using Chromebooks, but it's very um, evident that Windows devices still have a place on the network, whether that's for administrative users or in the classroom for the teachers where they need access to a bit more software. And certainly legacy MISs such as Sims have been one of the key reasons for uh, keeping computers in there because you can't install it on Chromebooks. Um, you can't install it on um, anything really uh, other than Windows devices. But now with access to web based MISs, you know that hurdles come out of the way. So at the moment, most schools probably locally manage their devices, which means they have to be brought into school periodically to update and sync um, and manage and policies to be rolled out to them. However, with cloud, it's all done over the Internet. So whether that's Chromebook or Intune devices, doesn't matter where that device is, it'll get all the updates. So we've um, deployed over just to our multi academy over uh, 1200 Intune devices. And when we want to update and roll out software, I don't need all of those devices back into one of our schools. So I press a button and it sends out the information to all of them. And within eight hours, they've all got the update. And it's the same as if you've got Chromebooks in your school. Makes it so much easier to manage, makes it so much easier to support users. Both have options. If it's not working, you do the great old IT trick of turning it off and on again, and it will reinstall from scratch um, and they'll be out of the box brand new solution there. So users are able to get back up and running really, really quickly. And it doesn't compromise on safety and security. All of the 1,200 devices that we've rolled out have the same level of internet filtering at home as they would do in school and the same level of uh, monitoring um, uh, as they would do in school as well. So we're meeting our requirements and uh, they're keeping children safe in education, ensuring our safeguarding is there, but also, you know, that 
support for students to be able to open up a laptop and have every resource that they need available to them uh, wherever they are you know if they're split split families it doesn't matter if they're mums or dads they can open up that device we know that they're safe and we know that they've got access to everything that they need um, in those places that is so so important these days um, to make sure that no child gets left behind in education because they can't access a workable device and it's something that we've only just started to see the impact from lockdown of this um, widespread across education and cloud enables it and um, it's so it's really important that the the schools and the end users and the IT all understand about that journey and how we can move, continue to move that forward as the technology develops over the next few years. So I've already talked about this uh, as well. The, the Google and Chromebooks they're managed from the Google systems, and Endpoint is the Microsoft system. Um, just a point to note: uh, under Microsoft Endpoint, you can actually manage Windows devices, Android devices, and iPads all from the one login. So if you're spending money on a um, on a system to manage your iPads at the moment, um, and you've you know you've got Office 365, then actually you can manage Android uh, tablets and such like, and iPads all from the single uh, point. Um, and uh, you know it's all covered under your Microsoft licensing agreement as well. So well worth bearing that in mind. I recently built some tablets um, and uh, I didn't want to spend the 300, 400 pound on an iPad. I got 130 pound uh, Android tablet, which has got a, uh, a SIM card built in so the, the kids can use it anywhere. And I've got complete control over what they do. And I've got safeguarding controls installed on there as well for 120 quid plus uh, a license of Senso on there and it works perfectly, all managed from the same place as well. Um, so all that data is in there. So um, really, really exciting uh, times for the you know, right device, right person, right place. OK, so that's I'm going to shut up now for a bit. Hopefully that's helped people. And as I say, there'll be a Q&A at the end of this session, so um, you can ask me any questions if you want real world experience. Um, I am going to introduce you now to Beth and Rebecca. Um, I'm just going to turn their um, the ability for them to share on, hopefully, and um, they'll be introducing you to Arbor. And then after that, we'll be um, uh, taking a look at Bromcom. Beth, are you there? I am, yeah. Hi. Um, hi everyone. Excellent. Thanks for joining and thanks for that intro, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here with Rebecca as well. Are you there, Rebecca? Would you I like me here. to allow you to do your presentation? Have you got a presentation or are you talking? Yeah. Oh. Can, I, can I present, please? Is that OK? Yeah, of course you can. No Thank worries you. at all. Let me just find you in the list. Didn't know you were going to make my face so big on that slide, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. You should be you should be able to uh, present now. I can. Thank you. I'll do so. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, I can't just yet. Hmm. Try again. I think Matt stopped sharing now, so it might work now. Yeah, let's try again. Hopefully <laughs> you can see my screen. Got it. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for um, inviting us, Matt, to this session. We're really excited to be here. Um, we are talking today, um, myself and Rebecca, I've been at Arbor for just under two years. Uh, before Arbor, I was one of the sales leads at Sims, so potentially a bit of a dirty word for some at the moment uh, but I have does mean I have been on that very similar journey to so many uh, schools and mats across this country who are kind of looking at that more uh, dynamic um, cloud-based system rather than something um, legacy like Sims. Um, I've also been an ed tech consultant um, and a business owner as well over the years. Uh, my job at Arbor, um, basically I work with mats of all shapes, sizes and phases. I travel across the country meeting um, everybody kind of from the office-based teams in schools and um, through to senior leaders and senior leaders at central level as well, just really understanding what your key challenges are um, and how technology um, can really support and solve some of those challenges. Yeah, hi. Um, so I've been at Arbor about four years now um, and I've 
uh, for most of that time, I've been managing our partnerships. So Arbor, one of our real strengths is we have a really um, strong network of partners across the country who deliver support for Arbor. They help schools find out more about us and, and, and like Matt's just gone through today, more about the cloud in general um, and help them with their long term IT strategy. So I, I manage our relationships with them. Um, before that, I, I was um, a TEFL teacher for a little bit. So I have taught not in England, but I have done a bit of teaching um, and I am a chair of governors as well. Um, I will just be here to um, monitor the chat. If you've got any questions as Rebecca speaking, um, you do feel free to pop them in the chat. You can save them till the end if you like, but um, if it's little product things, I can um, jump on those in the chat as we go along. So nice to see you all. Super, thank you, Beth. Thank you very much. So uh, what's coming up? So we're going to just give a little bit of information about Arbor. Um, personally, I think it's as important to know that the product's right for you as a partnership and the company are right for you as well, if you're going to invest in something quite new. Um, we are going to show you a little bit of Arbor today. In fact, that will be the majority of what we do today. I'm showing you um, Arbor's capabilities and what it can do for your school or multi academy trust. And um, we're also going to talk through the Fast Track programme, which is uh, very much in line with um, the the, um, announcement around, or well, not even an announcement, the, uh, the details that Sims have sent through to their current customers around the three-year um, three year commitment uh, with, with, with quite short notice. We're going to talk through how we're handling that as an organisation. Uh, we'll also talk through a little bit about the migration and onboarding process and then look at uh, next steps as well. Like Beth says, please do ask questions in the chat. She's there to, 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 to man that um, and no question is ever a daft question. Um, so at Arbor, we're on a mission to transform the way schools work for the better. Um, this is really important to me. As I said in the, the, the overview of my background, I came from Sims. And um, when I came to Arbor, I was literally gobsmacked at how passionate um, every single person is at Arbor about truly wanting to support schools to change, to transform, to use technology to be able to get better outcomes from children. Uh, that is what it's all about for Arbor, um, and, and I'm really pleased to be able to say that. Um, another thing um, about Arbor is that we're also backed by social impact investors. So not only are we backed by the key, which hopefully is a name that you recognise and respect, you know, we're part of the key group, um, which is people like Governor Hub and also Scholar Pack in there as well, as well as the key and their content um, solutions that they do. We're also backed by a business called Nesta, which is a social impact investor. And what that means in layman's terms is that, that when we sit around our board meetings, having uh, conversations about profit and loss and all those types of things, actually a lot of our time is dedicated to what outcomes that we have met within schools, within communities and um, across our country. And that's what we're held accountable for um, with Nesta um, when it comes to those meetings and the work that we do with schools across the country. We are the fastest growing MIS today, so we now have over 2,000 schools and multi-academy trusts that use our tools to be able to work much more collaboratively uh, and, and to free staff from very busy work um, and drive um, their schools forward as well. We work with um, schools from the smallest of, of, of primary and special schools. We've got actually over two thirds of the special schools in this country already use Arbor, and that's because we are so um, bespoke in some of their requirements and Arbor can really support that. We're so flexible in what we do, particularly around assessment, um, that special schools and those that have real unique requirements um, find Arbor is a really flexible tool to be able to work with. We also work with the large multi-academy trusts in the country so United Learning, AET, two great examples of maps that chose to work with Arbor and are parts of our community and also um, secondary schools and um, smaller maps no matter what size phase or shape that you are um, absolutely we, we, we've got the expertise to, to work with you successfully. RMIS joins up people, systems and policies across your school or trust. And I love this slide because I think it really stands out. When I think about conversations that I have with MAP leaders, school leaders, school business teams um, across this country each and every day, um, a lot of them think about an MIS as just being a system to do some admin work. Sometimes they might take the registers on it for teachers. And Arbor is a complete it does all that. Of course, it does it all really well. We can do the centres, we can do all these things that you need to have to do in terms of those systems that you're using for now. But we do so much more than that. We want to make sure that teachers, students, parents, admin staff, SENCO, data managers, leadership, governors, whoever you may be, you've got the tools that you need to be able to do your job uh, productively, efficiently um, and, and enjoy doing it along the way as well. 
So we also work together as one organisation because not only have we got a market leading school MIS, we've also got the only MAT MIS in the country. What that means is it's not just about aggregating your data at a trust level, which we do really, really well. You have that central overview, but you're, we're the only MIS that you can take action from that area. So you can see what's going on across your schools, but you can take action. You don't have to go back down to school level um, to be able to do something about that data. We have things like policy push down, and I'm going to show you this in just a few minutes time. We also perfect for both single phase and mixed phase maps with your primary, secondary, mix or whatever it may be. We have the right solution um, for you as well. The app, the MAT MIS that we have also means that it's a really simple solution. So if you think about Power BI, um, Matt, I'm sure that you've had many, many games with Power BI and you've taken a lot of time and I'm sure you're a, a, one of those IT geniuses that I call it that use it really, really well. But not every school, not every multi-academy trust has a MAT standing by um, every time they need to set up a new dashboard, for example. So the Ar Arbor MIS enables a really out of the box, straightforward solution that's just there. You can get on it and it gives the information that school leaders, map leaders need um, without having a great barrier to access. So I am now going to go into the Arbor MIS and show you a little bit about what I'm talking about. So the first bit I'm going to go into, and hopefully you can still see my screen, Beth, if you can just confirm. You caught me out there, Becca. I wasn't looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So this is the Arbor um, Multi Academy Trust. It's a fake site. Canalot doesn't exist. We're not sharing confidential data here. Don't worry about that. Um, but this is going to give me that overview that we're speaking about from a trust perspective. Now, I know on this call today, we're going to have trust leaders. We're going to have trust central teams. We're going to have schools that don't have anything to do with the Multi Academy Trust. I appreciate that. And I really am going to share something for all of you um, just starting at the group at this, at this point in time. So at the top, you'll see some headers. We've got an analytics area, and that's what I'm going to delve into to start with today. So simple things. A lot of you at the moment, if you are part of a multi-academy trust as a school, you may get asked on occasions, quite a few occasions, to get some data, to gather some data for the trust uh, trustee meetings or, or, or for the CEO or the CEO or whatever it is that they're looking to do and they need some data from schools. Well, in the Arbor MIS for maths, you can literally just pop into this area here and it will bring up your statistics. Now, this is live and up to the second. There's no overnight lag uh, as it's updated in the school MIS. It is updated in the group MIS. So I can see at just a quick glance how many students I have enrolled across my trust, how many boys, girls, people premium, EAL, etc. I can also hover over these numbers and it'll give me a comparison from this year to last year, the difference between those two years, and also what the trend has been over the past three years as well. I can click into this information and it's going to bring it up in clusters for me. Now, I set these clusters. I was talking to a multi-academy trust just a couple of hours ago who has an exec head across three separate schools. I have um, a trust that I was speaking to last week who's got a geographical head. So they've got a three, four primary schools and a secondary school as part of their geographical hubs across the, the different areas of the country that they're based in. So for them, being able to set clusters up in those ways is, is, is just really, really suits their, their model. But you could also set up things like new to the trust. If you're a, a trust on a, on a, on a, a, a growth spurt and um, you've got trust uh, schools that are just recently part of your mat, you might want to put those in a separate area to analyse those compared to those that have already been in, in the trust for a while. We might want to separate primaries and secondaries. Whatever you and how you manage your trust and how you'd like to analyse that data, you can do so in this cluster area here. But again, I can click on through into this information and it brings up my statistics of pupil premium and um, uh, by schools, so by the primary schools that I've clustered into. I can hover over those and I can see how many students we're talking about in terms of the cohort for pupil premium across that particular school and the percentage and how that compares to the rest of my trust. I can also click into that and that will eventually bring me down to student name. Now, if you're a trustee, you can absolutely have permissionable logins to the group product, but you wouldn't get down to student names. It'd just be those statistics that you saw before. Now I can do that across numerous areas of this product. So whether we're looking at attendance, behaviour, assessment, all those key measures can be done. Now if I pop over into assessment for just a second and look at key stage two to follow that detail through, you'll notice here that we've got a DFE performance data area. Now we are the only MAS provider that is also a DFE benchmarking partner. So when it comes to ASP data, which I do appreciate is a little bit out of date right now, although still very, very useful over a three year trend, 
And um, once that comes back uh, after COVID has has, has hopefully um, disappeared or, or at least calmed down, um, you'll be able to click into the DfE performance data and really compare your trust across the country with other schools, other maps, um, looking at that national um, and, and top quintile details in there as well. Now, the last one I'm going to show you in the analytics areas is attendance area. Um, very similar, it's going to bring up the headline measures for you. You can click on through, it'll bring out your clusters for you, but it'll also bring up your year groups, it'll also bring up your demographics, and it'll also bring up your ethnicities to compare those side by side. Now, you'll notice in the analytics area here, I've got this Arbor admin. The Arbor admin means it's not ready to show you yet. It's been beta tested by some of our customers, but what that will enable us to do is up in here in the filter area, you can also filter about things like year seven pupil premium across my trust or year three SEN across my trust or whatever demographics, year groups, um, clusters you want to compare, you'll be able to do that very, very easily in a search filter at the top. If I continue through with the same uh, air way I did last time, so going into the primaries and bringing up those um, schools again, click back into House and Primary Academy, brings it up my, 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 my year groups now, I can really compare that attendance. Now, obviously I've got, I can see right here, I've got a, probably a, a little bit of a concern with my year sixes here. What, they're behind the trust average, they're um, less than 90% across my whole year group. I might wanna click into that and understand more and I get down to student name again. So. This is great. Lots of analytics solutions do that. They're not out of the box like the Arbor one, but they do that. But what they don't do is they don't enable you to look at uh, Keely Martin, for example, who's at 71% year to date, and click in to Keely's uh, profile and do something with it. So that's the difference. I can say, I'm not just looking at as a trust leader and I'm focused on attendance. Yes, it's about the attendance across my trust, but it's also about how I can make an impact on that attendance. And so it becomes about Keely rather than a number. And so I get to look at Keely's profile and I look to go in her attendance and her statistics and what her attendance looks like over time. But I also get to go, well, what impact has that had on her progress, where she's working at, for example, or um, how about I look into some analysis of her performance over um, a, a period of time? Or maybe I want to look in safeguarding notes to understand, is there something that's triggering this attendance? Or was there a behaviour incident that triggered this attendance issue? Or or, 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 or there's so many different scenarios it could be, but every bit of information I need about this child is in this one place. So from a trust level of looking at my greater uh, attendance across my whole multi-academy trust, within just a couple of clicks, I'm able to drill down into a child and, and look at how um, outcomes are being met for that particular individual across my in my schools. I'm going to go back out of there uh, just for a second and back into the trust. I'm nearly finished on this level. So analytics can be done across all these areas here. You see we've got staff and HR area, we've got assessment, we've got behaviour, we've got numerous things that we can look at. But what we've also got is this administration area here, which is just brilliant. It really is. So if you have a trust and you are looking to centralise some of or align some of your policies, this is a brilliant solution that enables you to do that. So to start with, User-defined fields is brilliant. Now, user-defined fields is, is, is anything, right? It's anything you want to put in. I really like this one in particular. It's something we get asked about quite a lot. So as a trust, if I've got a specific safeguarding policy or a behaviour policy or whatever it may be, and I want to set that at a trust level, I can set it in here, set my yes or no, my, my, my staff members accepting it, and I can push it down to every single one of my academies in my school and show that every single one of them has accepted and read that policy. That information then pulls up in a report to trust level, so I can pull that off and understand who hasn't read and accepted that policy. And the same can be done for all the things on here, plus anything else that you can think of. It's a user-defined field. So for me, I, I love that area. I think it's really, um, really, really, really powerful. The other thing is assessment and behaviour is coming. It's in our roadmap, as is uh, pay scales, I believe, as well. But assessment's here and it's working really, really well. So in Arbor, um, it's quite different in terms of assessment for uh, compared to Sims. Um, we don't have to write or build a million aspects to start with. We set our rules here at the central level or at school level if we're a single school. So we, we, we set our rules for grade sets, what we want the grades to look like. We build our assessment catalogue. We set our school target rules, our target judgment rules. We we, we, we say how many times we're going to assess. Uh, we, we, we choose our language. All that, all that is done here at a trust level. 
and then it can be pushed down again so that it's identical across all of my schools. If I want to align my schools on language, on colours, on columns, anything like that, I set the rules here, it pushes down and it builds those mark sheets for them. That will save days and days of time for a multi-academy trust. Now rest assured that can still be done at school level as well if you're A not aligned yet or B you're not part of a multi-academy trust and I'll chat to you about that in just a second's time. The last thing I want to show you on here if I can is a custom report writer. So as much as we've got all these brilliant dashboards that are built in there's always going to be something that you want that's a little bit different and so as an example I'll pull a couple out for you. I've got this staff absence report here. Now this was built, you can see it's very simple, it was built for a, a trust based in Kent who I spoke to relatively recently and she, the CEO there, had a real issue in trying to understand who in her trust was off with anxiety and well-being was massive for her and so I pulled this report together you can see you've got the name the staff member how many working days have been lost and the sickness category and I can break that down further into types of anxiety if I wanted to or whatever it may be I've got a business role on there so I can understand across my trust where there might be some well-being issues and where I need to support so it really took me and I'm not technical at all I can promise you that it took me about two minutes to build that report in a wizard thing so it really is easy to get a report like that out but you only need to build it once because I can schedule that report so if it's a really important report and it can be any report at all and I want that report to be sent out every Tuesday starting next Tuesday at um 2.55 in the afternoon and I want it to notify myself or whoever, we're going to put Joe in here as an example, I want to email it to Amir every single Tuesday starting next Tuesday at 2.55 that updated report will automatically send to the individuals I've requested it to be sent to with the right permissions, it'll be notified, they'll get a box here letting them know it's arrived or it'll be emailed to their email that links with Outlook or Google. So you can really see there that you can, uh, you can uh, save a lot of of time by just setting the reports you want um, and scheduling them to go at a time that suits you. The very last thing that I'm going to show you in here is back to that report. We've got a little button here called download. So any table that you see in Arbor, whether it's in the school or the trust level, you'll be able to click this little button here and download it and take it out of Arbor. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you've got some quirky reports that you want to set up or you want to share it with individuals, you can do that by putting it into Excel. But you've also got the ability to live feed. What does that mean? Well, it creates a live link or a live feed between the report in Arbor and the document that you're working on. So is it Excel, Google Sheet or a Power BI application? So it means it's automatically updated in Arbor, it automatically updates in your sheet as well. That saves hours and hours of time. So if you are using Power BI, this will save you two days building one dashboard together by being able to use live links. I'll show you it in action if you like. So here's my governor hub. So we're part of the key. I'm a governor as well as Beth. We're both governors for, for, for local primary schools and I use governor hub. This is a fake school again, don't worry, I'm not sharing data. But here we've got a, a full governor's data report in governor hub. It's a secure area and I can click into that and it brings up the, the live fed report. And as it's updated in Arbor, it'll also update in this report for governors as well. So in their secure location, they've got a 100% updated report for their governors um, to be able to look at um, whenever they need to. So that's um, uh, um, the central product. So I am going to move on now, if I can, to the school products. So um, I am going to start with a student profile. We looked at a student profile very, very briefly um, at the start. And so I'll click back in to... Um, my student of choice, which is Mia. I'm in a primary school here. I'm going to flip between primary and secondary as we just go through this over the next 10, 10 minutes or so. So this is a student profile. I said earlier that this is where you store everything and you really do. For me, this is so powerful. It's a holistic view of this child. My behaviour isn't in a different system. My, um, my, um, my, uh, assessment isn't a in a different system it's all in one place so it really means I can understand everything I need to understand about this child and make some really informed decisions. Now we spoke about uh, tracking earlier I can click in and look at progress over time where they're working at I can go in and look at mark books and look at that statement by statement area if I want to as well I've got educational needs details in here where I can put a live link as well to a live report if you've got a google sheet or whatever it may be that you're using and um, you can add a, a secure live link into 
the SEN area to ensure you've got one live document for, 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 for that reporting. Um, I've got a brilliant intervention section here, which I'm going to show you in just a second. Interventions means you can see that attendance issue we spoke about earlier, that behaviour issue that they had, the fact that they're behind in maths or whatever it may be, are we doing something about it? Are the interventions in place? Yes, I can see that we've got a, a lateness issue and that's been dealt with. We've got a maths booster club and I can go in and see what reviews have been done and the impact of those interventions. And I can also see even what those intervention costs have been for that child, particularly if I want to relate them to funding such as pupil premium, for example. Now, um, this is a student profile and um, interventions is one of my favourite areas. So I'm going to quickly pop into that one to show you um, why it's one of my favourite areas. So here's my dashboard of interventions. So if I'm in my student, uh, my teacher area, and I, I, I saw that perhaps um, a, a child had moved from, uh, I don't know, blue book to white book or whatever it is that, that they're moving to, I might want to set them into a different group so I can track the effectiveness of that move. Maybe we've got a lateness and I want to track the uh, how um, successful an intervention is. So that's a, a good example, actually. So, so we've got this judo and breakfast club here. It was actually a proper intervention that's been set by one of our schools, and it's been a really successful one. So here, it was about lateness. We set up some rules, some criteria in Arbor. And so we said anyone who's, who's late more than 5% of the time, they automatically fall into this group. And, and once they're less than 2%, for example, we've got four in here, but or, 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 or never late again, maybe that's the outcome you want to track and th that's a success criteria when they meet that they've done what we wanted them to do and so we set that intervention detail up and we're able to track it so that when we go to our provision map over here i'm able to see my interventions i'm able to see how much they've cost because everything's in arbor it's not in different systems i know how much my staff cost because the, the the hours they work and the salaries and everything's in here um, i know what the timetables are so that, that's all in there and i've got my projected costs in there based on that and additional costs such as breakfast or lego or whatever it may be and then i can see who i'm pointing here who's met the outcome so for judo and breakfast club we've got 28 kids in there that are late more than five percent of the time but actually 16 of them already have met the outcome that we set that they're, they're no longer late and it cost me seven thousand pound but it, it, it's a decent outcome so if i go into the cost area here I can show funding sources. So what you're able to do in this interventions area is for your COVID catch up budget, for example, you can set an intervention. You can say what you've spent that money on and you can say what the outcome was, what success did you have from it? And it's really trackable and able to be shown to whoever needs to see that. So that's one of my favourite areas um, for that particular reason. No, I am been in primary a little while now, so I am going to pop into secondary for a second and I'm going to go onto the front page here if I can and just show you this area here. So if I am a pastoral lead, I might want to look at the whole school details. For example, I've got my attendance, my behaviour, my attainment here. With my teacher, I might want to look at this particular area here. So this is giving attendance, behaviour and attainment for the people that I care about as a teacher, as a leader, as, as whatever it may be. If I don't want behaviour in there, I can take that out. If I don't want attainment in there, I can take that out and just focus on attendance. If I want to look at the attendance for science as head of science, or if I want to look at the attainment for science, I can see in science across the whole school, 68% of them are below target, 7% above and 24% below uh, at target. So as a head of science, that's really powerful information. I can see the attendance. I can see the behaviour if I want to add that in as well. It really is up to you to make it as bespoke as you want it to. I can also do science people premium, for example. I can bring out any demographic I want to. You'll see now we just look at 64 kids. We can see who's below target, at target, so the behaviour issues. We can see the attendance for that. If I'm in a, a primary school, I can pick out my class. So if it's just, um, I don't know, 5QT, it's the one we use as a form group, I can pick out my class, or I can pick out a year group, or I can pick out an intervention. I can do whatever I want. It's, it's if, if a student's allocated to me, I can analyse that information really easily. Now, if I click into attendance, just to show you um, what it does, it, is it breaks it down by possible group within the school. So 
here I can click on the average for this year. So we can see that people premium below 85% is obviously top of the list there. But actually, randomly, home transport kids are really low on attendance. Now, that's not a report you're going to pull off on SIMS. You're not going to think, oh, I'm going to check the home transport kids. But actually, as a group, their attendance is really poor. And I probably wouldn't know to pull that report off. So it really does give you every possible group that you want. But if I just want to look at my year groups and their attendance, I can just click into there and see that detail. Maybe I want to look at particular demographics or demographic and inverse or ethnicities or genders and just look at girls versus boys, for example. I can do that and I can continue to add different filters to that. I've also got this area of custom groups. So any different group that I've set up, so home transports in there, but um, cross country teams, swimming teams, whatever it is, all those groups are set up in there for you to be to analyze their behavior, their attendance, and their assessment and their attainment as well. Once you get to where you want to be, so if we just go into this mass concern group, for example, I can click there and I'm gonna to get to student names. So I can see the students. And again, we're not just talking about at, at, at six people, we're talking about Sasha Collins or Connor Gray, you know, individual people we can click on and go and see their profile to investigate further. Um, I am just going to pop into the behaviour area because I do want to show you this. I think it's really great within Arbor. So in behaviour, um, we have this severity scale here. Now, one of the biggest things that we come across when we're talking to Max is that whole, um, I kind of want to give alignment, but I also need to give autonomy to my schools as well. Like that balance is really difficult to, to get. So here as an example, um, we allow that and balance that really well through this area of Arbor and others to be fair. So as a school, I get to choose kind of the behavior type and the severity that that means. So maybe smoking is a, a, a negative three, or maybe we're looking at positive behavior. So we want to look at our core values as school and say that they're positive two or positive three, for example, in terms of points given or whatever it may be. So you see set that, that, that scale up just there. And um, if I look in incidents here, I can apply workflows. So if I've got a severity minus two, for example, that's, that, that's smoking. Every time somebody smokes or is caught smoking, something happens, it's consistent. Your behaviour policy is set across your school. So first of all, it's, it, it notifies a head teacher maybe, or a head of year or a head of house or whatever it may be, or they just get assigned an automatic detention and a letter goes home or a message goes home to a parent. Now it's all set up as a workflow. So if, if that behaviour happens, these happen as well. So you can really think out a great behaviour policy, even at trust level and have that same behaviour policy and understand them and, and then, not only do the, 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 the staff members know what happens, but the kids know what happens too. So if they smoke, that's going to happen. If they bully, that's going to happen. It's, it's automatically going to let X person know or the parents know or whatever it is. You can really, really manage your behaviour policy really effective um, in Arbor um, here. And this isn't just about negative behaviour, by the way. It really is about positive behaviour as well. So as a, as a parent to, um, to a little boy in year two, um, for me, I don't get to hear much from the school that he's had. And I'd love to. And if something good happened to my child today, I'd love an automatic notification to know that he got three points today in maths and ask him about it. Like for me, I'd love to get that and I don't. So this can be used primary, secondary uh, for positive and negative um, behaviour um, as well. Um, the last thing I want to show you, because I think it's really important and I am conscious of time, is I want to show you the parent area because we spoke about speaking to all different stakeholders. We've shown you governors, we've shown you senior leaders, we've shown you numerous different things. Um, but I do want to show you the parent area. So here we've got a parent area um, and everything can be done in here, everything. And again, as a parent, I have six systems that I use in my little boy's school, which can be a real headache to manage. So here I can book parents evenings, no problems. I can um, look at overdue assignments or assignments that are due homework basically. I can check the quality of the homework, I see what the marks are, everything around homework is done in here. I can pay for meals, clubs, trips, I can give consents etc. It's all managed in here really easily. There's some nice statistics on here so behaviour incidents, positive, negative, whatever it may be that you want to show. Now all this is permissionable by you as a school, you choose what you show. If you don't want to show any of these statistics and you don't have to, it's all done and set on what you want to show. I've also got a student profile here. So um, you can see consent, student details. I can click on here, change the home address. I can, um, you know, if, if we're moving house, change the phone number, it can all be done on here. And yes, if you want to allow the office to, uh, to approve that change, you can absolutely do that. 
um, rather than um, a change has been made and, and, uh, and it not be correct, for example. Um, we've also got things like consents on here, medical details, and um, all of these can be added as many as you want, whatever's applicable to your school, um, and they can be filled in and um, updated via the app rather than having a massive job for the school office to do. You'll also see down here we've got things like um, examinations, so examination results can be sent through here, report cards at the end of a school year or end of term can be done through here, everything that you communicate with parents wise can be done through this app. So for me it really supports parental engagement. A trust I work with in Kent and um, Howard Academy Trust, they had numbers from 60 average of their parental engagement right up to nearly 90% or 95% I believe for one of their schools on using Arbor parental engagement solutions. But not only does it encourage that engagement, genuinely it also encourages that that engagement between the parent and the child as well because they've got so much more information to talk to them about rather than it being siloed and all over the place. So back to the deck for just a second to finish off if I can um, present my screen again. I hope you enjoyed that little demo. There is so much to show of Arbor and um, I'd love to give you more information but we are um, on a strict time today. So just to finish off I said I'd talk you through the fast track programme. So um, Sims are only giving schools the option to renew their contracts for three years and many schools are trying to work out whether they can switch MAS by ESA 2022 because they don't want to be signed into that three-year contract. The notice that you need to take today is there is still time to switch. So we have designed our fast track program um, to help you make a decision quickly and confidently. So more detailed demo tailored to different roles is our next step. So we can do some deep dive demos through our fast track program that I believe are happening in the next week or so. So we'd love you to sign up to those um, demos and those webinars. Um, we'll also speak to your local partnership manager. I, I'm one of those. I deal with Max. And I'd love to speak to some of you and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting to just really understand your requirements, what you need to do, what your worries are, how we'd manage the change management for you, what the migration looks like, etc. Do that one-on-one -on -one meeting and then you literally receive your, profile, uh, your proposal, agree your moving date and sign your contract and then we do the rollout. The rollout hasn't been compromised. The sales process is shorter, hence the fast track program, but the migration to our hasn't been compromised. We understand how long it takes to onboard a primary school and a secondary school, whether you want primary school or secondary school or 50 primary or secondary schools, the process is still the same. We haven't compromised that. We believe it's tried and tested. It, 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 it gives a brilliant experience. And go and look on Finimores and see the um, on buzzing experience of many of our schools and maths. They've got an independent uh, uh, survey on there. Go and look at them. It's, it's really excellent feedback. Um, and so that's not compromised despite this pressure on us all to make a decision really quickly. And um, the other thing that we can talk about here is that you can make an easy switch to Arbor and not pay until April 2022. So if you wanted to um, fast track quicker and you wanted to be live on Arbor by February, for example, um, you can move to Arbor for free and not pay until the 1st of April 2022 when your SIMS licenses renew. So you get to get started on Arbor quickly. You don't have to worry about that double paying for MIS. Um, and yes, there are some terms and conditions that that partnership manager will be happily to, to talk you through them. And there's just a little quote one here from uh, Bridge Schools Trust. Um, talking about how they work with Arbor, um, they talk about our passion um, to, to, to do what we said at the start, and, and they talk about their uh, really positive experience. And there's many more Lightbridge out there, many maths, many schools that would love to talk to you um, about Arbor. Again, at BET 2020, I'd only been at Arbor just a couple of weeks, and I went to BET 2020 just before the first lockdown, and I was just shocked at how many of our schools, how many of our trusts were stood by talking to other schools and maths across this country. Um, uh, about their brilliant experience with Arbor. When I worked at Sims, I didn't have that. It, it was just so nice to see people wanting to tell everyone else about their great experience about working with Arbor. So what happens next? Um, give notice to Sims. Now, we do recommend that you give your notice to Sims as soon as possible. You need to buy yourself some time. We're not saying you need to give your notice by the 31st of December and that's it. You can still rescind your statement of notice next term. But if you don't give your notice in by the 31st of December, you won't be able to have a choice whether you decide to move or not. So if you do want to consider this, um, please do make sure that you get your notice into SIMS. Um, step two, um, we're going to email you after today, today's session. We're going to 
invite you to one of our special fast track webinars and then we'll book that call in with you to talk about your school or your math specific needs and um, step three is choosing your new mis and deciding how to buy it depending on your size and phase it may be that you can just buy our directly but you also might need to consider a framework like g cloud or everything ict and again we can really talk you through those procurement options to make sure that you're following a seamless procurement um, uh, route um, and then fourth and finally uh, impartial advice see map Matt's worked with both Arbor, Bromcom, Sims, you know, his team at Lords have experience of using all the major MISs, including Arbor. They're impartial and they're a great um, source to go and speak to about anything that you want to want to talk about about MIS. Any questions? There's our details. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much for that. That was a really useful uh, session. Um, just to, uh, so everybody's aware that um, if you want to have a follow up, then you'll see in the chat uh, there is a, a link there to register about uh, for your information. So we won't be sharing it because we didn't declare that we'd share people's details with the supplier prior to the event. Um, if you use that link um, and then choose whether you want one or both of the uh, speakers from Bromcom and Arbor to get in touch uh, for you today, then um, use that and then I'll pass on that information to uh, Beth or um, uh, Bromcom um, and they'll be able to uh, um, get in touch with you as they said there just so that nobody thinks we're going to pass on email addresses without any permission or anything like that so just use that form on the side but thank you very much Rebecca that was very very good and very uh, almost bang on time as well so that's brilliant thank you very much a uh, lot to show off there okay so we're now going to hand over to uh, Bromcom and Martin are you there I am yes Excellent. So, uh, Martin, you've got the ability to share your screen. So, uh, yeah. if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Um, and it's uh, so it's 30 minutes from now, which will leave us a bit of time for Q&A at the end. Yeah, that's great. OK, if you can give us a, a prompt on time, Matt, if I'm running out. I will, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, thanks, Matt. So from the slides, I think you some of you might have been expecting to see Jez. Um, our regional account manager unfortunately uh, he is suffering from covid at the moment and is off sick my name is martin baker i'm the local authority and partner manager at bromcom and i'm backed up in the chat area by roger lewis if any of you have any questions as you go through um, Personally, I've been working in EdTech for the last sort of 25 years. The last 15 or so of those have been with uh, MIS. Uh, like Rebecca, I've had a stint at Capita uh, and more recently at Bromcom. And I think in all, in all honesty, for the majority of those 15 years I had, there was a um, there was very little alternative to Sims, uh, but the last three or more years or so have been very, very exciting in MIS. And you generally have choices now. And I think you'll see two very exciting choices today. Um, uh, I won't uh, echo a lot of what's gone on before, but if you if you are looking to embark upon an MIS, which is potentially a three to five year project, you know, we would urge you to investigate further. Um, what I'll do is I'll do a quick introduction to Bromcom. So uh, Bromcom was founded in 1986 and that gives us one of the longest tenures in UK education. We're a wholly UK based company and I think it's fairly unique as an MIS supplier in that we don't offshore any part of our operation whatsoever. Our third line support team uh, sit next to our developers at our office in Bromley and this means that problems can be quickly understood and resolved. I think that kind of long tenure and structure is very important because you can't build an MIS system overnight. They do take a long time to uh, refine and develop so to speak. So take, take the cloud. Bromcom's been in the cloud since 2000 with our My Child at School parental portal, and that is trusted by over a million and a half users. The overwhelming majority of our thousand and growing school community 
use our parental portal, probably got penetration rates of above 95% because they use our app to do absolutely everything. It's that joined up picture that Matt started to talk about at the beginning. In terms of our MIS, our MIS was released in 2005 and from day one it was designed to run in the cloud. It was launched in a browser and in 2010 it went cloud based. So you've got a fully field tested cloud based MIS and it's securely hosted within the UK within Microsoft Azure. Um, our vision is to offer the most comprehensive MIS on the market with unsurpassed functionality and exceptional value for money. Um, what you don't get Brom with Bromcom is sort of our interpretation of an MIS, take it or leave it. You're getting over a decade and a half of distilled feedback from schools, academies, multi-academy trusts and local authorities. And what our schools have actually fed back to us is probably, you know, one size doesn't fit all. There's differences between primary and secondary. And they told us that they actually want a seamless data journey, a journey that's driven by their workflows not constrained by their current vendors modular data structure and probably that's what we're talking about here a lot of you will recognize that as the historical core and curriculum backbone of sims our schools asked us to look beyond this because their mis mis ecosystem um, encompasses a lot more they might be using parent pay for online payments uh, school comms for their communication packages, OTRAC, Insight for assessment, CPOMs or my concern for safeguarding. Those are all additional points of vulnerability when things go wrong, GDPR contracts to manage, they're more expensive and they all involve inevitably the duplication of data. Um, Schools want to be able to access their MIS anywhere. So with Bromcom, you've got dedicated parents, students and teacher apps. Uh, technical colleagues want uh, Microsoft and Google integration as well. And we have also had many requests from schools to provide an integrated MIS system. So uh, Bromcom currently is the only cloud based MIS with integrated cloud finance and Matt finance as well. Um, we talked about being focused upon outcomes at the beginning and we this is our one stop shop and it is our most comprehensive package and it gives you all the tools to actually do that at school. You update any data aspect in that diagram and that diagram, sorry, and that uh, change propagates through the system. It updates dashboards, triggers alerts and updates staff as well. It gives you all the tools you need to make those timely interventions that we're all looking for that can have a positive impact upon a child's outcomes. We also work with some of the most well-known partners within education. So if you move to Bromcom, you can phase out your third party products uh, as their contracts uh, generally expire. You wouldn't expect to move everything on day one into a new MIS system. In terms of uh, Academy trusts that use Bromcom. It's uh, currently used by Lords and some of the most well-known Academy trusts in the country. We've done a lot of work with the Harris Federation to document the cost savings of cloud. If you go on to the internet, type in Vanessa Pittard, XDFE, uh, there's a good case study there. Harry saved about £2.8 million over three years on an estate of uh, 40 to 50 schools. Um, 
it's not been all plain sailing, shall we say. Um, about five or six years ago, some of our multi-academy trusts did tell us that uh, there were better ways of doing uh, an MIS at the primary phase. We thought long and hard about that and we implemented a separate primary and secondary development team and that started to bear fruit and we've now got certain primary only multi academy trusts choosing Broncom as well recently. So we're a genuine all phase supplier from nurseries, small rural primaries, large urban secondaries with a solution that encompasses MIS, finance, a multi academy trust uh, system as well with local authority data aggregation and virtual campuses. If any of you have peripatetic staff, um, even though we're like say we're 100 percent UK focused, we do have schools as far afield uh, as the Falkland Islands with our agreement with the Ministry of Defence. And for all of those multi academy trusts, we deploy a high level MIS uh, that can actually push out all of your policies, uh, include Power BI and benchmark against national data and schools, over a thousand schools that actually use the Broncom system, the Broncom vision system. So you can actually get your national you can get your uh, benchmarking more or less up to date without waiting for the feed from the DFE. So at that point in time, I'll quickly jump into our software. There you go. Your session has expired. Um, so. OK, so we're now looking at our uh, Broncom primary system. Um, I said at the beginning, Bromcom is not an out of the box solution. We've got that decade and a half of feedback from schools actually telling us what they would like to see. We're just looking at a lesson dashboard here, and that would probably be the thing that is deployed as standard throughout a school. But we can also have insights or an overview. So this level, you might have elevated responsibilities and you could actually construct a screen that's probably very, very familiar to what you have in Sims if you want to add any number of widgets there. Uh, if, you, if your responsibility is for attendance, you can actually set the attendance page as your home page. Likewise with behaviour or safeguarding, and we do have an end of year uh, dashboard at the end, which can actually actually talk you through that process. If you're an administrator, you can actually switch between any of those roles there. Uh, so you can actually see the impact, any changes you make when you push your system out uh, before it goes live with your staff. Um, at primary level, uh, one of the key participant shall we say in driving the MIS is you could say the the admin manager the data manager but what they will say is that actually that may be my role but I've got a million one things to do um, I buzz people in at reception I answer the phone um, I accept deliveries etc etc and these colleagues have told us they want a single screen that they can do absolutely everything from and this is that screen here if you go to your uh, profile page you can actually set that as your home page just by clicking there and every time you come in this will be the screen you actually see and it's telling me i've got 383 uh, children on roll and i can start to bring in some search filters here I can construct the screen to bring in the filters such as they looked after children I most commonly work with. But here we go. So the head may come in and tell me how many pupil premium are there across the school. So straight away I've gone down from a 360 odd to 21. It might be OK, so how many of those are in year six? There we are. Um, OK, so we've got a quick straight drill through to all of the information we actually need. 
And at that point, I can actually reset it. Uh, I've completed that task and we're back to our main screen here. It might be that um, we have this system here. So we've got year six. Again, I would want to know how many are on free school meal. Four, let's just quickly go back to the whole school. I can run a filter on the year group here. So someone might say, how many people are on free school meals in year five and year six? We can just actually straight away filter them out. And I might be asked for an Excel printout of those, but I'd want just a little bit more information so I can use this to actually construct a very, very simple report. So uh, um, the head may say, I want to know the percentage attendance for those, um, whether any are EAL, and should we say looked after, and then we save. OK, so we've got a, a ready made reporting tool and all of that data we can just simply and quickly export to Excel there. Um, if I wanted to reset everything. I could then go back to everyone in the school and it might be that I need to um, make a send a communication out to everyone in year six actions straight away sms email sorry i didn't select a student so i need to select all in year six and actually if i wanted to i could put another filter on and exclude some quickly there send a message um the recipient is the main contact we can bring in our dynamic fields dear so and so um, and then just simply type away our message, whatever that may be. Uh, we can select send push notification to all our priorities, consolidate multiple messages. And when I click send, that then goes out to everybody in year six. It could be a, just something as simple as we've got a school trip and the coach is running late. Uh, we can update all of our parents there that are on that trip or in a group. And the important thing here is send push notification and that will send a notification to a parent's mobile phone. So you're saving a significant amount of money on your texting uh, costs as well. Okay. So if I then remove all of those, it may simply be that I'm on reception, a couple of children come in, um, the head says um, quickly uh, enter a behaviour event so I can enter behaviour directly from the system as well. Whatever scenario is presented in front of me, let's keep everything positive. So it could be something like helping others. These three children have helped a member of staff with uh, books, etc. across the playground and we can then just submit that data straight into the system and we're recording our behaviour there as well. It could be that we have a number of children who have turned in late. We need to actually look at attendance. So again, this child has turned in late, 12 minutes late. Uh, this child here is going to be, let's say they're going to be ill for the day. Again, if I want to add a comment, I can do just simply a cold. Um, and Aaliyah here is going to be at a doctor's appointment this afternoon. And there we go. So I'm more or less managing everything that's uh, arriving during my day on this one screen here. Um, we're on year six. If I needed to do my end of year processes as well, I can do them here. I've got my CTF export if I want to, where I can export uh, all of year six or certain individuals. Pop back to my home screen here and I'm on my register. Um, so this will be the screen that a lot of members of staff will drop into straight away and we can see that we have notifications here for what's happened during the day. Devon and Ellie have already demonstrated positive behaviour where Sam has actually demonstrated negative behaviour as well. Um, these areas are in red because I haven't taken either of my register so if I wanted to take my AM register straight away click here. This is what a member of staff would see in the Bromcom system. 
OK, um, we have our little flags here. These flags run all the way through the system and they can report on things like pupil premium. Free school meals etc etc gifted and talented our schools have told us that they actually want those flags because all those are those fields crop up all the way through the mis they would like to see them on should we say assessment areas when they enter data in as well and we can see here's the child who invented as uh being on a medical this afternoon and as we drop down we can actually see that uh, the dinner pattern for the child is being filled in as we go through. It might be here that Eva has forgotten a lunch and we can simply set that to a school sandwich. OK, it might be Dev Devon's not feeling very well. We can actually click here and we can actually say, well, uh, Devon's not ve feeling very well. Chicken curry might be a bridge too far. We'll just go for a chicken roast dinner, save. And that's then in the system and we'll feed through to your dinner statistics as well. We can select our children and from there we can enter all our behavior events record a dinner payment if need be as well um, we can have a projector mode if we like to actually take our register on the project uh, on a projected screen if we have a birthday today that will be there as well to come out of projector mode i need to enter in my password Try one more. Sorry, more fingers and thumbs here. And there we go. We're actually back to our main screen there. So a straightforward registration process and we can see within Broncom there's a lot of tabbing. So whatever screen you're on, you can actually uh, revert back to it and, and keep your workflow. We also have at the bottom contextual help. Very, very important. So for instance, if I was on that front desk and someone came in with uh, a dinner payment, I needed to add that. Um, manual adding a dinner payment. Here we go. It, were, it won't explain the process and it won't actually take you to a YouTube video. What it will do is it will hold your hand through the process within the MIS itself. OK, select the student that's required. Next. Actions. Dinner. And there you go. It will actually talk you right the way through the process where you can manually add a dinner payment for that child. In terms of the assessment, uh, we've got all of our assessment sheets that are applicable to our class. Um, if you want to replicate what you have in Sims, there is something that's more or less got the sophistication and the comprehensive nature of assessment manager. But what we found now is that uh, more and more primary schools in particular are going out for packages like Insights and for instance OTRAC and there's nothing you can do in those that you can't actually do in Bromcom. So here you decide what your subject is, how what year you're on, how many data drops you actually want. And then we will see our uh, mark sheet where we can enter in our formative data. We're actually working with the DFE statement banks there. Uh, they can all be exported, uh, amended and re-imported if you wish. Uh, we can take our colours on and off. We mentioned before about the ability to add in additional columns. So if you want to print that out, you can add in additional your additional contextual information and print all of that out. And um, it's just a case here of selecting the grade you actually want with in the system. We can record evidence. It's much, much easier to do that via the app that the teachers would use rather than saving a picture into the MIS, locating it and then attaching it to the child. Um, 
certain feedback we've had is that we actually certain schools actually want to flip the way the screen works like that. Uh, essentially, um, it gives them the ability to scroll down the comment banks with the mouse wheel and then maybe flood fill. You can flood fill horizontally and you can flood fill vertically as well. If you want to bring on a summative judgment, you can actually add that at the end. If you don't want to bring on a summative judgment, you've got your summative assessment here. And again, as before, you choose your, your term. We've got our core subjects actually coming up. If you want to analyze any of that data, um, here, for instance, let's go analysis, just simply have an attainment overview. Um, within Broncom, you can actually filter on your tutor group or perhaps a report group. Broncom automatically maintains report groups within the MIS. These are vir virtual ones, so if anyone's got um, English is an additional language or a high attainer, uh, they will move in and out of that group and you can actually report on it. If I just quickly go to yeah, my tutor group, what I want to look is let's have a look how these are doing from really whatever period of time I want to look at. I'll include interim assessments and let me look at mathematics, reading and writing run your report and we can actually see the progression of that tutor group across in this case what is one one year and one term if we want to bring in any extra columns we can do we can simply have say percentage at and above and then run the report again um, move it quickly through um, if we wanted to look at that say we say a primer the prior attainment map. Again, let us select our tutor group. Year six. And we will go. Well, let's have a look at our progression. Year six across two terms. And again, let's look at uh, mathematics. We'll run our report. We've not got a lot of data there at the moment because what I did was get rid of it. So that is our autumn midterm. What I wanted to what I do is I go to our autumn end of term. We can see everything's and see if I did a quick flood fill across that. We can put all of our data in, say let's keep things positive at uh, exceeding. Um, and then if I wanted to just go back through and say somewhere below, we could do that. Also, what we can do is we can expand our grade set. So we could we could have some children who are making fantastic levels of progress, but they're making it uh, sort of outside the year six remit. They were going sort of uh, from, you know, below year five, working towards. And then if we went back and redid that report, we can see you've got your classic transition matrix that we're all used to. Um, conscious of time, I'll quickly skip through here and just give you a very, very quick overview of our secondary screen set. Uh, it's very, very similar to what we have in primary. Um, we mentioned sort of two different flavors of the same. Broncom has got four cover modules, uh, full exam module and its own e-timetable, and it but it can also accept a timetable from Nova T6. And give me a second, if I wanted to check the register, this would I suppose would be one of the key differences in the system whereby with a second review you build up an overview of what's happening during the day and the previous in this case probably 10 15 instances of the lesson okay and if we wanted to mark everybody present you can flood fill or let's just quickly go down
a lot, a lot of absentees in there. Um, OK, and then that would save. We have access to assessment and seating plans and behaviour here. If you quickly need to enter behaviour in, we can enter, say, something positive for all of our present students or our absent students or anyone who's late as well. So we can quickly filter out on our behaviour there. Um, sorry, the presentation controls are actually hiding my cloud parent portal here. There we go. OK, uh, quick look at what parents would actually see within the Broncom system. So this is our parent dashboard. There we go. Well done. It's logged me out. OK. And parents have got a complete overview of everything that's happening with their child in the school, any announcements, classes. You can book parents evenings. Um, a data collection form. This is where parents can actually update their data uh, with Broncom. Uh, you can actually bring in your pre admission students as a group so you can actually use this area of the software for parents to actually of children who due to enrol soon to actually complete their data there as well. Your assessment, your attendance. OK, and all of this is available in a very similar vein in the app. You can actually track any homework if that's set within the homework area of Bromcom. You can actually book your parents evenings here. Uh, there we go. Um, so we only need to book one parent evening there and we are working on having parents evenings via Google Meet, Teams or Zoom. That should be with us very, very quickly. Any electronic report in the system that exists will be available to preview and download there. Uh, we have our school shop as well where we can look at everything that's on sale. Uh, or um, split it up into, uh, should we say, uniforms and equipment. We have our clubs and our trips. OK, so um, if we need to involve in any clubs, want to go on any trips. Very, very powerful area of the software. So if I wanted to enroll my child for the USA trip, we can see uh, we've got a lot of installments to pay there. The system will actually manage all of the reminders. And as you actually look, as you actually register, you would go into the group for the Heathrow trip. And from that admin dashboard at the beginning, you can actually push all of um, the your messaging out there as well. Wrap around care here. This is the uh, after school club we're enrolled in already. We're not in enrolled in these. And from there, we can actually click and we can actually decide what sessions we actually want. And again, uh, the payment is actually going on to our online balance extremely conscious of time. So if I just quickly go back to our, our primary MIS or the secondary and give you an overview of our. Sorry, Ma Martin. Yes, I'm afraid you've run out of time. All right, sorry. OK, <laughs> sorry. Sorry to be so strict on it. Um, but uh, thank you very much for the, the in-depth presentation there. Um, I just wanted to move because I know obviously this is uh, close to two hours altogether all in. So I just wanted to um, move to the question and answer just quickly um, before because I have to leave to go to a meeting at four that I can't miss, unfortunately. Um, so uh, massive thank you to Martin, to Beth, to Rebecca for their time and their uh, overview there of their um, different solutions. Um, it's very, very uh, worthwhile arranging a one to one session with either of uh, both. So you get a good overview of all the products. There are, of course, other products on the market, um, uh, uh, you know, that you need to have a look at as well. Um, things such as ISAMs um, and, uh, and other providers that uh, will be able to um, uh, give you an alternative um, for your three quotes or whatever you need, depending on which system you go for and how you quote, um, uh, get your quotes and like through the different um, platforms. Um, as Beth touched on and Martin, um, I have worked with 
um, both Arbor and uh, Bromcom over the last 12 months. I've migrated schools from Sims to those platforms. Um, although I move on from Lords IT on the 14th of December, uh, January, um, uh, I uh, am around um, on Twitter. Um, I'm always up for a conversation on there if you'd like some independent advice. Um, and I'm not disappearing completely from the education view. I'm just moving on to pastures uh, new. So it just leads us now into a bit of a QA. and a um, Don't forget on the chat window, if you'd like to um, uh, request further information. There's a link there. Of course, you can reach out to any of the uh, participants today if you've got LinkedIn or um, Twitter or any of those platforms. They don't really care how you reach them as long as you reach them somehow um, about and talking to them about their products. So if anybody's got any questions that they'd like to ask just in the last few minutes, 11 minutes or so, um, do you want to pop your hand up on the uh, on the teams at the top of the screen? You can raise your hand if you just click over where it says reactions and I can turn on the voice for you. Um, and so you can actually ask a question. So don't all go at once. Um, but if there are any questions, uh, OK, thank you, Jonathan. I'm just going to turn your mic on. There you go, Jonathan. Oh, uh, you're muted at the moment. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here now. Great. That's about it, right? <laughs> uh, it's not a question specifically to any of the providers, but it's more a case of we're, we're a sim school. We've been a sim school ever since I've been here, so that's a decade and a half. Um, so I'm just thinking about if we were to consider migrating to another product, what the advised timeframes are because with the contracts coming out for, um, you know, renewing contracts, You've got to make a decision by by the end of December and then you you pay for it in February. So it doesn't give you very long to consider switching to another provider and getting all your staff up to speed, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, you wouldn't really want to be introducing a new system, I don't think, in the spring or summer term, but I could be wrong. I'm just looking for advice on that sort of migration piece. So just I, I'll hand it over to Martin and Beth in just a second. I know Beth talked about, and I'm sure Bromcom have got the same of a uh, a quick um, a pathway through to adoption in light of the Sims news and the three year renewals and, um, you know, doing it for free, I believe Arba was saying up until April. Um, in my experience, we managed to migrate uh, 12 schools um, to Arba. Um, uh, no, sorry to Bromcom. Sorry, um, over the whoopsies over to over the summer, um, and uh, you know that was a pretty pain-free experience. And then we moved a uh, trust of three schools from Sims to Arbor again within a matter of, of weeks um, as well. Um, you know, with all the conversations and everything, the act both platforms and other platforms all have tried and tested automated migration. Uh, routes um, is that's not the difficult part of the whole thing. The difficult part will be training your staff yeah, um, and working with all your um, external bits to work into the new system. For example, our biggest bugbear when we moved to Bromcom was pay, parent pay um, for being a pain in the backside. Um, so, you know, it, it depends um, how up for it your staff are. Um, Beth and Marta, I don't know if you if you've got any further feedback on that. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first, Martin, as, as we went first in the presentation? <laughs> no, it's fine. So um, I, I generally hear that probably Easter is a bet, one of the better times to actually migrate. Um, speaking to all of our schools um, over, over the summer, um, there's the capacity to actually, uh, should we say, lose track of what you've learned and Christmas has its own unique appeal to us all and we're all we're all anxious to break up for Christmas sometimes without thinking too much about what's happening in the new year so we tend to find that Easter's probably one of the better times. Mm. Um, we would say um, I suppose there is there is time um, as Beck said in her presentation there is still time I know it feels really tight and um, could speculate about why Sims have picked this particular time of year to do it. Um, but there we go. Um, th there's plenty of time to both have a look at suppliers, um, Bromcom, Arbor, Scholar Pack, which is a great one for primary schools, um, and, and Matt mentioned a few others. And then um, 
as Beck said, you can give your notice in um, by the end of December and then rescind it if you decide actually you haven't made a decision or you, you don't want to. But um, one of the comments that I saw, I think on Twitter or EduGeek the other day was, it's kind of like deciding whether you want to go with a hot, pon a hot point or a Bosch to replace your like wooden washing board. It, you, whichever one you go with, it's going to be a better decision. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter which one you choose. Of course it does. And you should choose Arbor. But <laughs> you... <laughs> really um, need to think about, do you want to be on a server based system for the next three years that has consistently let customers down and move to the cloud? Um, and we can help you get your staff trained. We've got really good teams that will get you through that um, quickly and in a straightforward way. Um, and we've also got, as I said, a network of partners um, so you can stick with someone local if you want. Um, so you've got lots of choices. Brilliant, um, thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry Be uh, Rebecca. Yeah, sorry, just really quickly. So um, from an Arbor perspective, if you're a secondary school, um, we need to be really looking um, by the 17th of December to make a decision for secondary migrations. And if you're primary, we're looking around the 22nd of February, just to give you a couple of dates to work to. Does that answer your question, Jonathan? Uh, yes, secondary here. Single, single secondary, not a mat, but um, yeah, still feels like a, a huge mountain to climb. But thank you for the responses. I, I was just going to say that I agree about the comment about over the summer holiday. We did ours over the summer holiday and the amount of people who forgot it and then didn't really have the time to learn it in the first few weeks of September. Actually, you know, I think a couple of weeks um, between training and then picking it up is people a lot and uh, you know there's not so much to do after come after easter as there is in september so i think that's actually a really good piece of advice on there sorry just to add to that we don't do it as a big bang you know you move over like one weekend or one week it's you know a journey over a period of weeks where you will um you know send us your data you'll get different staff groups trained so it, it won't all happen at once it's managed martin sorry so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you're two different flavours of the same, so our process is <laughs> very similar. But um, I, I sort of know from my background that with, with Sims, you do own the licence in perpetuity and your really hard close will be, I think, the census in May. So you could, you could potentially use Sims unsupported after april but you would you would need to if you're on your chosen system with all the data in to produce that census i think is it towards the end of may that is really you, you, your hard close date yeah, thank you a li little bit of wriggle room shall we say as for contingency okay Lovely. thanks that's good to know we use school ict services for our sim support so i think actually they provide they also offer support for Arbor and Broncom and for the transfer as well. So I suppose we're in, in a pretty good situation. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much team as well. I would recommend chatting to them about it. Thanks, Jonathan. Is there anybody else with any questions at all? Can't see any other hands up at the moment. No. OK, not to worry. Um, hope that the event's been useful for everybody and certainly planted some ideas. Um, as I say, if you want to get in contact, um, Twitter um, for myself um, and then for anybody else here they've got profiles everywhere but if you go to their websites they've got the telephone numbers if you want to, a few people to come back on the form that's in the chat view and I'll email that out to everybody as well at the end of the session so if you want to get more information you can do um, so just uh, again to wrap up a massive thank you to Beth Rebecca and Martin really appreciate your input and doing this for me uh, with me this afternoon um, and uh, thank you everybody else for your attendance have a great afternoon um, and this recording will go up on um, onto you YouTube um, uh, in the next day or so um, and if you give me a follow on Twitter you'll be able to see the link for it and I'll put it in the email that I sent tomorrow to follow up on today's as well have a great evening take care bye-bye now yeah Matt thanks everyone bye, bye.